Hello, welcome back to Piers Rocks. Today, we're gonna to fill three empty ROM sockets with one software ROM. We're gonna start off though with a 1541 disk drive. And that's because we've not had any disk drives on this channel for a, a few weeks and I'm missing disk drives. So this 1541 is missing the two ROMs back here. There should be a top ROM here and a bottom ROM, ROM here. And if you turn it on without either ROMs installed, then you just get this solid red light and disk drive spinning. So I'm going to take the software ROM and install it in the top socket there and then turn it on. And you'll see it has actually booted now, but it's reporting an error. That's because the top ROM, the kernel ROM has loaded, but it can't find the second ROM installed. We can fix that. We take a wire and put it into the chip select line of the second ROM, so that's pin 20, and connect it in to the software ROM, turn it back on, and it's booted. Next, a VIC-20. So this, this VIC-20 is missing its kernel ROM and its basic ROM. If we turn it on, we'll get a black display because the kernel ROM is not initializing the VIC chip. So we turn it off and we install our software ROM. We turn it back on. And the kernel is now running and it initializes the video, but there's no basic ROM installed. So let's fix that. We install the cable into the chip select line, of this ROM socket, plug it into the software ROM, turn it back on, and it boots. Now the C64. This is missing three ROMs, the kernel ROM, the basic ROM, and the character ROM. And the character ROM is a different sort of ROM. It's a 4K ROM, whereas the other ones are 8K ROMs. So if I install the kernel ROM and turn the machine on, then it's not going to boot. We'll get a display, but we don't get a sensible display because there's not even a character ROM installed. So let's first of all install the character ROM. So chip select line and plug it into the software ROM, turn the machine on. Now we get this blank screen because there's no basic ROM for the kernel to start. So if we plug the kernel ROM in as well, into pin 20 of the ROM socket and into the software ROM, turn the machine on, boom, it boots. You may have noticed that I was plugging the chip select lines from the empty ROM sockets directly into cables that were flapping in the breeze. That's because my current solution, my current hardware revision, I don't expose the STM micro pins that I need to take in those extra chip select lines. So I have a couple of bits of very fine magnet wire soldered directly onto the STM pins. And doing this type of soldering is never a good day. So I have a new hardware revision on the way, hardware revision F which exposes the two additional pins that are required, these two ones that are green in this diagram. They're labeled X1 and X2 that you can actually plug external flying leads into. At the top here we have the image select jumpers and I did that entire demo with just a single set of firmware on the software defined retro ROM and I just changed the jumpers between the different sets of ROMs that I wanted to serve, the 1541 ROMs, the VIC-20 ROMs and the C64 ROMs. At the bottom here you have the programming pins for the software ROM. And in terms of the schematic, this is the schematic for the new hardware revision that supports this capability. You can see I was previously using port C pin 0 to 13 for the address lines and the chip select lines for serving a single ROM. I'm now exposing PC 14 and 15 for the external chip select lines. This allows me to still read in a single 16-bit value from a single port on the SDM microcontroller, which is a single ARM instruction, and use that value as an offset into a ROM image lookup table that's sitting there in RAM. So when you're using ROM sets, instead of using 
a 16K RAM image for the ROM that's being served. It was 16K because it was using 14 bits. It's now using 16 bits. So whatever the size of the ROMs, the number of ROMs in your ROM set, it always uses a 64K image in RAM to store all of the ROM information. And these extra chip select lines are being used as inputs into that lookup as well. This is, I think, the fastest way that it's possible to look up the byte in software. This approach is also limited to a maximum of three ROMs because you've got a total of three chip select lines. And there are some other limitations as well. All of the ROMs that you're serving simultaneously have to reside on both the same address bus and the data bus. That's why on the C64, I can replace all of the kernel, the basic and the character ROMs because they all share the same bus. Whereas in the VIC-20, the character ROM shares a different bus from the kernel and the basic ROMs. So the character ROM can't be replaced with a single ROM in that. It should be possible to extend this approach to a machine like the Commodore PET that has 2332 ROMs and replace multiple 2332 ROMs. I haven't tested that yet. I think it will require a little bit more development. There's a little bit of complexity around the additional chip select line that you get on a 2332. If you, if all of the 2332s that you want to replace, one of the chip select lines is shared between all of the different devices, which they are on the PET, one of the chip select lines is tied to the no ROM input signal, then this approach should be perfectly possible. It will require a few more instructions in the main loop to serve multiple 2332 ROMs because of that extra chip select line that needs to be checked. But there's so much additional headroom in this solution for the PET. Right now, the minimum clock speed required from your STM32F4 to run, emulate 2332 ROMs through my testing is 26 megahertz. The slowest F4 STM32 can be clocked up to 84 megahertz. So there's at least three times, three and a half times headroom there. So I think there's plenty of capacity for doing the 2332 emulation for those older machines. Here's the updated config file format for multi-ROM sets. You can see I've introduced this new set parameter. And the first set has the two 1541 images. The second set has the two VIC-20 images. And the third set has the three C64 images. And you'll see I'm ignoring the second chip select line on a character ROM. That's because it's always tied active on the C64. A few other updates I wanted to give. So I've now got a status LED on the software ROM. And this is currently just lit once the ROM has finished booting. And I can show you just how quickly it boots by removing the power and then reinserting it. And the LED will only be lit once the ROM has finished booting. So I don't know if my finger got in the way there, so I'll just do it again. The boot time, last time I measured it, was about one and a half milliseconds without any logging, three milliseconds with just standard logging installed. I'll show you the logging now. And the easiest way to connect to the logging is to reflash a device and then reconnect to it as soon as the logging is complete, which is what this command will do. And to show you one of the bits of value of the logging, the device I've got here is actually an F405, which is more advanced than the F411 I'm going to flash it for. In fact, this is a clone 405. It's a Giga Devices 405, which is much cheaper than the stock STM32 F405. It seems to work fine from my limited testing. But I'm going to flash it as a different STM micro type and this is just going to install a standard collection of VIC-20 ROMs on the device so it's downloaded the images it's building the firmware it's erasing the device it's reflashing the device and now it's booted and all the logs have scrolled past already so the logs start here and you can see it detects this is actually from the chip itself what type of chip it is how much flash it's got then it tells you some information about the firmware itself and how the firmware is configured and you notice it detected it was compiled for an F411 with 512K of flash. And it notes that those are mismatched with the current firmware versus the device. Also, the pin configuration. This can now be configured. And you can write a very simple JSON config file. If you have your own PCBs with a different pin mapping for data pins, address pins, chip select pins, select pins, status pins, then you can define that in your own JSON file, select it at build time, and it will build you the correct mappings. There are some limitations around that. The ports have to be the same ports that are used by the stock hardware designs, and you have to stick within the, the ranges for data and address pins. 
due to the way the software works. But beyond that, you can remap the layout of your PCB and the pins from the ROM to the STM device. Then the logging tells you what ROMs were built into it. And then it gives you some logs from actually running the device itself. And we can see which ROM it has actually decided to load based on the select jumper was set to image zero. So it's chosen the image zero and it's giving you the name of that give you some other information about what it's about to do and then that it's actually started serving the ROM image and yeah the status LED is lit on the device so it's ready to go. Here's the hardware mapping file for the revision I just wrote to. So you can see it's very straightforward you just define what ports are what. As I say you have to keep these the same values at the moment and also what pins are used for what purpose. I have a tool that will analyze a firmware file. So if you build a firmware file and you're not quite sure what images it's got in it, you can take a binary file or an ELF file and give it to this tool and it will tell you. So here it tells me what device it was built for. It gives me some of the configuration options, like the fact it's got the status LED enabled, shows me what pin mapping it has built into it. And it also gives you details of the ROMs. So if this one has four ROMs installed on it, and it tells me what files are in each of them. So this is presumably, well, this is a VIC-20 one that we just wrote. And we have all the VIC-20 ROM images here. I hope you found hearing about the improvements to the software-defined retro ROM interesting and useful. This C64 has been sitting here running off a single software-defined ROM while I recorded all of those segments sitting at my desk. It's been running perfectly fine and stably. This is an F411 clocked at 100 megahertz. If you have any questions about the Software Defined Retro ROM or any enhancements that you suggest I add to it, please do put those down in the comments below. The ability to run multiple ROMs off a single Software Defined ROM was a suggestion that came in from Adrian Black and from Peter Neal, so thank you to them for that suggestion. If you enjoyed this video, please do stick around. Till next time, rock on.